Well, good morning. Welcome. It's good to be here with you today. Um, I want to, I know Joe mentioned this, but I want to thank you for um, your graciousness. Uh, if you are new with us this morning, normally our parking lot is available for actual parking. Um, but I know uh, today we have a, we have a great um, party planned and being together and, and community and neighbors and just friends and so thank you thank you for parking off site and walking over in less than ideal weather um, what just it's so encouraging I gotta say to just be a part of a community um, that is willing to as we talk about do whatever it takes just to, to meet neighbors and reach our community and um, I'm excited that to share in that with you um, one of the privileges I have as a pastor, and just um, specifically as spending most of my career in student ministry, is I get the opportunity to um, officiate and attend a, a lot of weddings um, of former students and just people in the church and share in that moment with them. And weddings are one of the few events in life where we still have a tendency to send a formal invitation to that. Right, it's one of the, back in a day, like you would get those for birthday parties and all sorts of different events, and now that just comes like via email most of the time. But a wedding is different. Like we send a formal invitation. If you can, if you're married, you can think back to the process of sending out those invitations. Like when Sherry and I got married, there was this book that was like a thousand pages long that had like millions of different types of invitations, and we leafed through it, and it was like, some of them were embossed and some of them were written in solid gold and some of them were like you had to pick out the font and the color and everything had to match and you go through and how's it going to be worded and and for whatever reason wedding invitations have like copious amounts of envelopes right like i think the the uh, the envelope industry has has somehow worked their way into the wedding business or whatever because you get the invitation in an envelope but that's just the envelope that they write the address on. You open it, then there's an envelope with the actual invitation. And inside that envelope is another envelope wherein you can let them know if you're going to the wedding. And it's just all very confusing, right? <laughs> but, but the most critical part of the wedding invitation is, is when you're deciding who gets one. Who's going to make the guest list, right? Like that is a stressful time. Um, and there's the obvious people, like there's you, your parents get to come because they're paying for it and, and grandparents and immediate family, like that's, that's, that's obvious. You have, you have your friends, the bridal party, they're all going to be there and, and so they're invited and then you've got that, that, sir, that third sphere of influence, people in your lives, close friends, coworkers, people that you want there. And then there's like that fourth tier, right? This is when you're kind of working down and you're sort of like, how many left do we have? How many more of these can we send? How many more people can we invite? And the curricula, the, the criteria that you use to determine that, right? It's wedding gift potential, right? <laughs> like what are the chances that this person is like, what is their, how am I, what's the check gonna look like? And I'm joking, I'm mostly joking. Um, <laughs> You know, today we've, we've been talking about this for four weeks, and we're wrapping up this series entitled, Won't You Love Your Neighbor? And, and today we're going to look at, at another encounter that, that Jesus has with this group of people that just, that just don't seem to get him, and, and they certainly don't seem to get what he's been teaching about the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God has arrived and how it, it flips the, the, the power structures and the value systems upside down and and they certainly don't seem to get why Jesus keeps inviting the, the undesirables of, of their culture and their time to come and have a seat at the table. The, the poor and the weak and the outcast, Jesus keeps bringing them into the conversation and including them in this kingdom activity. And, and this message that Jesus has been proclaiming from the very, very beginning, from the outset of his ministry, does not seem to align with their expectations of how things should be. 
how, how they understand the world to, to operate. And so for many of them, they, they look at Jesus, and to be honest, they view him as a threat. So Jesus, in, in that moment, does what he so frequently does. He tells a story. And it's a story about invitations, about rejection, about inclusion, and about celebration. It's a story that helps inform, as we're going to look at today, what does it look like to love our neighbors joyfully? What does it look like to, to view that as celebration? So as you and I continue in this practice, in this process of of apprenticing our lives after his teachings, what it looks like, as we've been talking about throughout this series, to take his words seriously. When he said, love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And how do we do that? What does that look like? So we're going to continue in the, in the Gospel of Luke. We've kind of been hanging out in the Gospel of Luke throughout this entire series. And we're going to flip to um, Luke chapter 14. And I, I want to just give a little bit of content here, set the scene for a moment. Jesus has been invited to be the guest in the home of, of a Pharisee. And if you remember, um, the, the Pharisees were sort of the, almost like the religious ruling class of the day. Um, they had a tendency to, to be well-versed in, but also to be very serious about the Old Testament and the Torah and, and how that worked itself out in their lives. But there was also this negative side of that where there was this very tendency to become judgmental and, and uh, hypocritical in what they were living out and, and, and how other people they viewed weren't living it out. And so this is not an uncommon experience for Jesus. In fact, if you read through the New Testament, you'll see this happens time and time again. Jesus is a rabbi whose life and whose teaching has now been gaining influence and there's momentum amongst the people, but particularly really amongst the masses, amongst the common, average, ordinary men and women of the day. They're attracted to Jesus' message in part because he's including them in it. So Jesus, as this rabbi who, who has this following, as he's entering into a new city or a new region, would have been invited into the home of, of the local religious leaders. This is kind of at one part sort of an expectation. It was, it was polite to do that. And at the other side of it, though, as we see, is it's oftentimes they're bringing him in to, to kind of test him. In fact, if you look at the very beginning of chapter 14, when Jesus is sitting in the home of this Pharisee, it just simply notes that he was being carefully watched. Like, like Jesus, we're, we're seeing if you're the real deal. If we can, more negatively, if we can just sort of expose you as a fraud. The important people of the day were throwing a party in and. Jesus is there, and he is going to uproot their understanding of how God's kingdom operates. So up to this point, a couple things have happened here before we dive into this story that Jesus tells. One is the, the religious leaders have um, brought in a man who it says has abnormal swelling. It's the Sabbath day, and if you know Jew, Jewish law, the Torah forbid work on the, the Sabbath, and so they're, they're testing Jesus. Is, is his compassion for this man going to override his commitment to the law and will he act? And Jesus, again, he just sort of flips this on them. And he, under, he, he essentially says, compassion is the law. You're misapplying what God taught us about the Sabbath and he exposes their hypocrisy. Like, this happens so many times when, when people come with sort of ill intentions to test Jesus. And then Jesus goes on and he, he tells a story. He uses a wedding feast as kind of the backdrop of, of this example. And in doing so, he, he's exposing their pride and the way that they sort of jockey for position amongst themselves to, to elevate their, their sense of significance. And, and Jesus speaks into that in, in, on, on the topics of humility and generosity. And so this is kind of what's taken place. And now we're going to pick things up in verse 12. So this is kind of uh, leading into the story that Jesus is ultimately going to uh, tell. It says, Then Jesus said to his hosts, When 
you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers and sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Verse 15 then says, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast and the kingdom of God. Now let's pause there for a minute. So, so Jesus is, is, is reorienting them. We've been talking about loving their neighbors. And again, he's reorienting these religious leaders away from an idea of understanding love and compassion and action to other people from away from what am I going to get out of this and, and, and rooting it in a sense of compassion or, or said differently, rooting it in an understanding of God's heart for them, God's heart for us, God's heart for, for everyone. And in the midst of this whole conversation, this one of the guests at the dinner breaks in and said, that all, that sounds great, Jesus, that all sounds nice. And despite our differences, won't, won't, it be, won't it be nice when we are all properly seated in our places of importance when God comes in and reinserts his full reign, his full view? And this is the first thing I want us to look at today. I want to look at an assumption challenged, an assumption challenged, because this, the person that speaks up in verse 15, it almost, it almost reads as if this guy is just sort of attempting to cut the tension in the room. And so he essentially is saying like, well, let's agree to disagree here, but at least we can all agree upon the fact that when, that we will be the, the blessed ones when God arrives to set things right, when God reestablishes his kingdom here. And Jesus says, well, let me, let me speak into that for, for a moment. I mean, we all know uh, what it's like to, to have a wrong assumption. In fact, there's, there's actually research that's being done on, on the impact of social media in our lives and how it has a way of, of um, upending some of our assumptions or creates a sense of us in which that is happening. Because we, I started to research some of this in, in student ministries because I was talking about the effects of social media in students' lives, but really this actually crosses generational boundaries. Because we live in a world now when somebody, when there's a gathering of people together, it often is put up on some sort of social platform. And if I'm not in that gathering of people, but I, I associate with that gathering of people, there becomes this anxiety in our lives where we think, wait a second, I thought I was a part of this group. Like I thought I was a part of these people. I thought I was, so these people went out to dinner and they're having fun and those are my friends. Why aren't I there with them? And so we begin to kind of, well, maybe my standing with them is not what I thought it was. And, and we begin to question our assumptions about our social standings, right? And, and, and social media is, is, is sort of wreaking havoc in us in so many unintended ways because we see this view of what everyone else is doing. And so Jesus here is speaking into a set of assumptions, but, but instead of it being a, a set of assumptions that, that we look at and say, well, maybe I don't fit, Jesus is saying the set of assumptions about who fits and who doesn't fit, you're getting it wrong. You're misunderstanding it. See, there's, there's a couple things I want to look at. There's this reference in here in the early verses to this feast in the kingdom of God. And this is a, a common Jewish metaphor. In fact, Jesus had just made a reference when he, when he told that story about instead of inviting your friends and all the rich people to get together and you're going to get repaid, he said, he talked about how you'll get repaid in the resurrection of the righteous. So this, this Pharisee that speaks up is assuming that Jesus is referring to the idea that when Messiah comes, when he comes, he's going to reestablish Israel and back into the promised land, he's going to overthrow the occupiers of Rome, and they will once again reside and be God's people the way things were designed to be. In addition to that, the idea was that when Jesus does this, or when Messiah does this in their worldview, that he would surround himself with the religious 
elite, the people in power, those who had the ability to kind of advance his agenda. And they view themselves in that circle, that we're going to be the ones alongside of Messiah. Won't that be great? In fact, this is, this is what they refer to as being blessed, which gets us to the, the second assumption. The assumption of understanding who is blessed or what it means to be blessed. See, this person's sense of blessing is measured by his position in society. It's measured by his economic status, his, the influence that he has in, in culture, the power that he wields. And if we're absolutely honest with ourselves, if we're being fair, we, we measure our idea of blessing in, in some very similar ways. We often apply these same standards in our own understanding of, of what it means to be blessed. But from the very outset, when, when Jesus first began to teach, when he first began to describe and talk about and declare the arrival of the kingdom of God, he used a very different standard. Saying things like, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are, are those who mourn, right? For they're going to be comforted. He said things like, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are merciful and, and peacemakers and the persecuted. Blessed are those who are in, insulted because, because of their connection to me, Jesus said. See, to be blessed, according to Jesus, is a, it's not societal, political, economic, or even religious prosperity. To be blessed, according to Jesus, if I can borrow a phrase from, from Pastor Brian, is, is spiritual prosperity. And, and Jesus has been teaching the people about the truth of this from the very beginning, and it's, it's so different than, it looks so different than, than how they imagine it. See, you see what's happening here. There is an assumption that's taking place about, about who's in and how things are going to operate in the kingdom of God. There's a, there's a hierarchy and a clear delineation of, of who gets to be a part of this and, and who is left outside of it. And, and, and subsequently, the assumption here is that me and my friends and these religious leaders, we're, we are clearly a part of this. And the average, ordinary, everyday guy out on the streets, well, well they're, not, they're not blessed. And Jesus just deconstructs all of this. He, he takes apart these assumptions, which, by the way, he's still in the habit of doing in our lives. He's still in the habit of taking our misguided assumptions about who he is and about how the world works and what he wants. And he wants to deconstruct those and, and reshape them with truth. And in this case, he does so by telling a story. And this is the second thing that we see here. It's a, a story of, of invitation. I, I've mentioned to you all before that I am the middle of three boys. I have two brothers, an older brother and a younger brother. And my older brother is about four years older than me, and in and, and the middle school, high school years, things were kind of touch and go a little bit, because I just was at that age to constantly annoy him. And, and, but my older brother and his friends were like my gold standard of what cool was. Like what it meant, like who like the in crowd was, because my older brother was an athlete, um, his friends were athletes, they were whatever, you know? And the vast majority of our lives, there was like a clear, like, hey, Scott, can I hang out with you guys? Uh, no, right? Like the, the, but every once in a while, just every like, who knows? Like whether it was just like compassion in his heart or my mom made him, I don't know. Like he would say, hey, like, why don't you come? Why don't you come be a part of this? We're gonna go, we're playing football over here in the field. Like, why don't you come be a part of it? Like you could just let like my sense of self-worth just like, go you know ballooning like in that moment because like in my mind like I'm hanging out with the coolest people in the world right like I'm literally praying like like one of my friends would ride by on a bike so I can just kind of do like sorry you know I'm a, I'm with these guys today kind of like move and 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 hope like my social like status could like go up a couple notches or something because I was because I was in the in crowd right like we 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 know that sense, the power of belonging, 
The power, that feeling that you're one of us, that you get to be with, it's, there is a tremendous amount of power in invitation. In fact, we, we talk about this as, as a church. We, we do things like block parties and connection lunches, or even just saying like, hey, feel free to bring a friend or a neighbor to come and worship with us and be a part of this conversation. Like they're absolutely welcome here. We, we actively try to capture the power of invitation so that people have a sense that you belong here. You're invited here. We want you here. So now Jesus is going to tell a story back in Luke 14. We're going to pick it up in verse 16 now. So just price, this guy makes this statement, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Verse 16. Now Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I, I just bought a field. I got to go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told a servant, go out to the, the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. And I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Again, this, this story is loaded with cultural context and historic background, and, and there's so much that's going on here, but I, I wanna just sort of tease out a couple elements here. Because Jesus utilizes the very same metaphor, this idea of of the grand banquet, and he tells a, a parable. And just by way of reminder of, of the principal reason that Jesus offers parables in that day and age is, is to help his listeners, those that he's teaching, gain a fuller and deeper understanding of what the kingdom of God is like, how, how it operates. In fact, more often than not, before Jesus tells a parable, he'll, he'll use the phrase, well, the kingdom of God is like this and then he tells the story so imagine for a moment an elaborate party you've sent out the invitations in advance you you have prepared at great personal cost everyone says that they're coming they, they've rsvp'd yes and now the time has come the, the, the food is ready, everything is set. You go to the door to welcome in your guests and no one's there, right? Imagine, imagine the disappointment, the sense of, of rejection. The excuses sort of one after the other start to roll in. And everyone is a little bit different, but they're all also sort of the same. I'm just busy right now. I, I, I've got a ton going on. In short, one reason or another, this just isn't, it's not a priority for me. You see what Jesus is doing here? Je he's describing the spiritual condition of, of these Pharisees. The, the, there's all sorts of covenant history that's woven into this parable, but Jesus is saying, the great, this great banquet that you're looking forward to, I'm telling you it's here. It's it's ready, you're invited, and he says, and you're missing it. You, you've placed a higher priority on your, your religiosity, you've placed a higher priority on your self-righteousness, and you're missing it. And he says, notice the response of, of the host in verse 21. This is the beginning of 21. He says, the servant came back. He reports this to his master. He says, these are all the excuses that they gave for why they're not coming. And it says, the owner of the house becomes angry. Like, again, you can, you can, can almost like the, the uncomfortable, that, that feeling of the rejection that's there, the hurt, the emotion that results from that. 
But then also notice the response of, of the host in verse 21. We see that he becomes angry, but then midway through the verse, he says back to the servant, he says, go quickly into the streets, into the alleys, in the town, and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. He keeps inviting. That, that is his response. To, to their lack of understanding or interest that he has, that he is, I'll extend the invitation. He doesn't shut things down. He doesn't reschedule for a later date. He widens the invitation. He sends his workers out to the streets and the alleys to invite the foreigner and the, the overlooked and the marginalized, the people who viewed themselves as outside of, of God's activity and said, you're a part of this. He goes to those who have never been invited, who, who's never had a seat at the table, and he says, you belong here. This is for you. This, this is the power of invitation. Jesus is setting himself up. He's describing himself as the invitation. He's saying, no matter where you're coming from, there's a seat at the table for everyone. There's, there's a seat at the table for you. You're invited, I'm invited in, in the midst of my own brokenness, in the midst of my own shame, my own guilt, my own shortcomings, whatever it is. Whatever I look at, Jesus says, but you're invited. There's a seat at the table for you. So Jesus is now completely reframed their understanding of, of who's called blessed. See, blessing according to Jesus, is, is receiving the invitation and responding to it. Blessing, according to Jesus, is, is taking his invitation to have a seat at the banquet. These are the ones that Jesus calls blessed. So as he, Jesus tells this story, he's, he is both confronting the assumptions of the Pharisees and then simultaneously he is He's teaching, he's setting himself up as the invitation into God's kingdom. And he says, it's not for who you think it's for. In fact, that's the third thing that we see here. He's, and I love about this parable that Jesus tells, that there's, there's room for more. Remember in, in verse 22, the, the servant comes back, he says, Sir, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. And then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. And I was uh, in, in Wheaton um, doing student ministries many, many years ago. There was an um, organization that was there called Koinonia House. And Koinonia House was a program that was available to people coming out of the prison system to, be, to re-enter into society. And so they would, people that entered into this program would be given a, a mentor who also went through the program. And at one point in time, I had two of these men come and kind of share their faith story with, my, with our high school students. And um, I remember this story, it was so powerful because one of the men, the one who was being mentored, the one who was new into the system, started to tell some of his story and he pointed out so many of the tattoos on his arms and he was talking about what they represented. How they were mostly affiliated to the gang that he was a part of in the prison system and, and there were images of white supremacy. And that was his gang. Um, but his buddy that was mentoring him, that was helping him re-enter into society, who had been through the system himself, his name is Eddie, and he was, um, he was a black guy. And I remember Eddie just kind of like smiling and laughing and, and looking and sort of pointing to those tattoos and sitting alongside of this man with his arm around him and saying, bet you never saw this coming, right? Bet you never saw him sitting next to me, allowing me to speak into his life. And he's like, I gotta ask you the question, like how does something like that happen? How, does, how is that possible, he said. And he's like, because, it's, because we've been invited. Because, it's, because God invited me in relationship with him to transform my life. The, the, the areas where I was hateful and vindictive or jealous or selfish, God has been uprooting those in my life. So much so that, that when God started to do this same thing in my brother's life, this is how they referred to each other, 
who, who obviously were coming from very different perspectives here, God was going to use me to come alongside of him, to put my arm around him and begin the same process of uprooting those things in his life. You see, this he had an understanding when he looked at his, his friend to say, there's room for you here. There's room at the table for you, despite all our differences, despite circumstances that said these two people would never do life together. But the gospel changed that. See, what what does this story a couple thousand years ago have to do with how you and I love our neighbors? Well, what does it have to do with this idea of celebration? I think it's found in those words, there's room for more. Because when when we understand, when we respond to the invitation, when when we celebrate by continuing to widen the invitation, to be the the invitation for others, then we become an an extension of the same transformation that that was brought to us. We become an invitation that to the same transformation that God has done in our lives, and and it's there's room for more. I love the image of of Levi, um, who we commonly know as Matthew, and earlier in the Gospel of Luke, who's a tax collector hated by his own own culture, his own sort of ethnic group. <laughs> And, and, and an outcast, wealthy, but, but um, dismissed. And Jesus comes alongside of him and says, hey, I want you to be one of my disciples. I want you to come. And I mean, he just totally transforms his life. And the very first thing he does is he just throws this party and he brings all of his friends that, that society looked at and said, that's probably not the most appropriate party for Jesus to be at, right? And Jesus has those, those powerful words. It's, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, right? You get, his, you get his image. Levi understood after he has this encounter with Jesus that there's room for more. And the one, the invitation that he received, he then turned around and began to offer to others. So what's this all about? What's the point? It's all grounded in the fact that Jesus is the invitation. It's the reminder that you are invited. And so is your neighbor. So is your friend, your coworker, the guy that, that sits next to you at your kid's soccer game. So is your roommate in college, the, the, the person at the locker next to you in the hallway of your high school. So is that kid that's sitting by himself at, at a lunch table. Jesus is saying, you're, they're invited. You're invited to share in this because there's still room for more. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that, that we get to practice this in very real, tangible ways today. Lord, that in just a few moments, we're going to head outside and do life in community and eat together and have fun together and watch our kids play games together and And God, I do pray. I pray that our neighborhood and this community and the people you've put, I pray that they feel invited today. But Lord, not not merely to an event at a church. Lord, I pray that the invitation here would, would just be a picture of a much greater invitation. So would you do that in and among us today? And we ask these sayings in the name of Jesus. Amen. We want to.